Welcome to our next lecture and uh, this time period that we're going to focus on now we call it the New England Renaissance or to shorten it up a little bit we'll probably from this point on refer to it as Transcendentalism. Now even though Transcendentalism dates I have here are 1840 to 1855 quite honestly Transcendentalism and Romanticism periods overlap. In fact, many of the people who are considered transcendentalists um, also could, maybe by the other side of the coin, be considered a romanticist. In fact, there's two authors who sort of fit that description. The first one being Nathaniel Hawthorne, who we talked a little bit about in our last lecture. And Hawthorne, as which is very romantic of him in many respects, believed that reality in stories was not always necessary. That if you focused on an emotion, a human emotion, oftentimes that was what we needed to focus on even more than what was real, what was actually going on. He also focused, as far as emotion goes, on guilt and sin. And, and guilt and sin were very important uh, subject matters in his pieces, as we see in the Scarlet Letter with Hester Prynne, who of course committed the sin of adultery and then had to deal with the guilt and, and the father of her child, her cohort in crime, if you will, um, who committed adultery with her, also suffers quite a lot more distinctly um, the wages of sin. Another author during this time period who we consider to be both a romanticist in topic and subject matter and approach and also having transcendental qualities is Herman Melville. You might have heard of Herman Melville. He wrote a big book about a big whale called Moby Dick. And Moby Dick was about one man's obsession with um, a whale and obsession with something he couldn't have, that he couldn't grasp. Um, and so, of course, Melville focused on that. That's the human condition. We oftentimes want what we can have, or we chase that elusive dream. And so Melville definitely captures that. Interestingly enough, um, a lot of the people during this time period, during the Romanticist time period and Transcendentalism were friends. They, they hung out together in, in a very similar geographic area, Concord, Massachusetts. And definitely um, Hawthorne and Melville Melville were friends for quite some time, and in fact, you might say that Melville had a little bit of a crush on, on Hawthorne. He really liked him, the man. He was really impressed with his intellectual um, strengths and wanted to spend a lot of time, wanted their families to have a lot of uh, time together. Unfortunately, Hawthorne's wife really could not stand Melville's wife. So eventually, you know, when the wives don't get along, uh, eventually that whole relationship sort of fell apart. Um, and then Hawthorne moved overseas and Melville tried to make some other books and it's a whole nother story. All right. Um, what I'd like to talk about with a transcendentalist period is that we have um, sort of a dichotomy going on in the country. We have all of this prosperity and all of these really positive things, these flowers, if you will. And then on the other side of it, we have the flip side, the downside, we have the weeds. So we're going to focus on the flowers, first of all. Um, the nation continues to flourish. I mean, trade is up. Uh, democracy proves to be a really successful experiment. And for the most part, people are prospering. Then, as a result of that, of course, is a great sense of, of confidence. I mean, Americans, again, you know, kind of that whole we're number one. We figure this thing out and look what we can do. And again, as I said, uh, the prosperity is there, not for everyone, but overall, uh, the nation is prospering. Now, for the weeds. Well, with the prosperity growing, so also do our problems. For instance, we still have slavery. And so there are still people being very prosperous, but they're prosperous, many of them off the backs of, of an enslaved people. Um, there is poverty. A lot of the poverty occurs in the bigger cities because uh, factory owners are making a lot of money. Corporations are making a lot of money, but not necessarily the people who are working in them. Uh, materialism grows. Of all, you might not consider that to be a problem. Consumerism, materialism, People are getting away from the more agrarian society and being more obsessed, if you will, with things, even more so than they were before. We have political corruption. We have politicians who are buying votes left and right. Uh, we have all kinds of, in fact, there were problems like that back in the Romanticism period too, which is, as I said before, is roughly the same time period. So we have political corruption as well. 
we have wars going on. We're invo involved in some wars that we really shouldn't be involved in. Um, that started very, very early in our country's history. And you will learn more about those things in your American history class, so we won't talk too much about them. But even though we have these positive things, we also have some negative things uh, going on as well. And some of those negative things, as I said before, involve the, the factories and the political unrest, etc. We also have something kind of interesting uh, going on. We have a little experiment that, um, you know, we thought, hey, we've got this great experiment of democracy. It's doing well. Let's take it a step further. So a bunch of intellectual thinkers put together uh, what they called a utopian experiment. They called it Brook Farm. It was not the only utopian society in America during this time. It was one of several. And it ran from roughly 1841 to 1847. So it ran for about six years. Um, I think the beginning of its downfall was when there was a fire and some buildings caught on fire and they couldn't really quite come back from that. Um, but the purpose of Brook Farm, and people would kind of buy into this. In fact, I, I believe Nathaniel Hawthorne was one of the founding members um, of the group, but he didn't really see a whole lot of a point in it after he first invested some money. So he, instead of hanging out at Brook Farm for very long, he hung out there just long enough to gather information, and then he went off and wrote a book about it called The Blythedale Romance. Um, what Brook Farm was supposed to do was was pair up that, that farm labor, that physical labor, along with intellectual endeavors. So people would, you know, go out and milk the cow in the morning and then come in in the afternoon and have these grand philosophical discussions. Um, they attempted, basically, social principles, that sort of equal participation and equal distribution. Um, one of the problems with that, of course, was that many of the people involved with the experiment at, at Brook Farm had um, come from some pretty upper middle class backgrounds, and many of them came from homes that had servants. And quite honestly, they weren't used to doing a lot of the work that all of a sudden now they were doing. And that's one of the many reasons why Brook Farm didn't make it, although the people who were involved in the experiment considered it to be quite the success. A fun fact about Brook Farm, it was internationally known. A lot of people all over the world knew what was going on, and Beethoven himself first played in the United States at Brook Farm. And there's Beethoven. He looks a little crabby there. All right, so what kind of uh, literature? I mean, we're, we can talk about the history all day, but again, this isn't your history class. This is our lit class. So what's going on with the history here? Well, what we find out first and foremost is writers are now actively pursuing uh, breaking away from European models. We see that the romanticists were still really tied to those European uh, models of writing and style. And these authors now during transcendentalism are starting to break free. You, you might maybe look at them as being in their college years. If the romanticists were in their, their teenage years, then we could maybe say the transcendentalists are now in their college years. They still sort of need their parents, but they, they're really gaining their independence fast. And we see a certain number of what we call transcendentalism philosophies emerge, and they emerge for a number of reasons. They concentrated, as I said before, around a very specific geographical location in America called Concord, Massachusetts, and they were really spearheaded by one gentleman. His name was Ralph Waldo Emerson, and we'll talk about him a little bit later, but really these people were concentrated in this small area, so they were able to get together and, and create quite an elaborate intellectual community so that they could develop these philosophies, these, these common core philosophies, even though many of them had varied ideas about things. So here are the transcendentalist beliefs. Um, first of all, they believed that there were real truths out there, that the truth was specific and it was possible to find it, absolute beliefs in um, really just about anything you could name, how the world works, how people's emotions should work, anything you name it, there's real and absolute truths out there somewhere, and I'll explain that picture in a moment. They also believe that in order to really obtain absolute wisdom, you had to go beyond the senses, you had to transcend, which means to go beyond or rise above. Uh, they believed in, and this is actually a phrase coined by Ralph Waldo Emerson, a little something that we like to call the over-soul. And it's a little hard to explain if you look at it as an umbrella. The over-soul has a connection to man, a connection to, to nature, 
and a connection to a higher spiritual power power and many of these people came from puritan stock so you might want to call that higher spiritual power god not all of them did um but they definitely connected to a spiritual power and if you could connect to nature and to god and to your fellow humans you could transcend the senses connect to something else that governs all three of those pieces called the oversoul and then wow you'd be like in nirvana land so it, it sort of sounds a little bit like eastern philosophy which is certainly not a new thing, but it is American in the way that we um, have make it, made it here. And as I said before, nature now has become spiritual. Nature has become divine. Um, this picture, let's explain this picture here. Um, it is a picture, it's a sketch actually, that Ralph Waldo Emerson made uh, when he was talking about how he goes into nature as what he calls a transparent eyeball. That means he sees everything, but he blends in and he becomes part of that environment and he soaks it all in. It's kind of a frightening picture, actually. Um, and of course, as I said before, what kind of was born out out of a lot of these transcendentalist beliefs were a uh, utopian society such as Brook Farm. And there's those workers on Brook Farm. All right, so um, let's continue on with our transcendentalist beliefs. Very much like the Romanticists, the transcendentalists believed um, on an emphasis on the individual. The individual was the most important thing in the world. They also still held on to those democratic ideals, much like the Romanticists. Hey, we're number one. Look what we've done. Let's do more of the same. In fact, we can get even better and better and better. We can achieve perfection. Um, along with achieving perfection, you know, I talked about there being flowers and weeds. Well, it's great to focus on the flowers, but we also, if we're going to be awesome, we have to fix what our growing problems are. What, what's starting to go wrong? Let's go ahead and fix them. And we had some serious issues. As I said before, we had slavery. Um, guess what, girls? We still did not have uh, any rights. We still had to rely on our husbands to vote. Uh, we had, they voted, and we just hoped that, that they voted in a way that would maybe we agreed with. Uh, we didn't have really many rights at all outside the home. And one of the really cool things that transcendentalists did is they invited women into their intellectual communities, women like Margaret Fuller, and they would have great conversations um, about how women needed to have equal rights in society. And um, they even had a great conference in Seneca Falls, New York, where they wrote the Declaration of Sentiments, which was sort of a woman's declaration of independence. And both men and women, the transcendentalists, uh, attended that. Now, it was going to be about another 100 years before we did anything really strong with that because we had a bigger problem um, in our country. We were enslaving a whole population of people. And so we needed to take care of slavery first. And it was kind of like one problem at a time. All right, some basic transcendentalist philosophies, and you definitely should write these down. First of all, um, they relied on their intuition. They relied on what they felt and what they knew. So they combined knowledge with emotion, and knowledge and emotion together make intuition. And another, I guess, another phrase for intuition that you might relate to better is gut feeling. They also relied on their intellect, their brains, and nature is big. You're going to see nature popping up all over the place with transcendental philosophies. In fact, here it is again. They sought to live close to nature because the transcendentalist belief that the closer we got to nature, the smarter we were going to be, the more enlightened we were going to be. Now you compare that all the way back to the Puritan philosophy where they were afraid of nature. They felt the devil lived in the woods and it's a completely different uh, perspective. They found evidence of their beliefs in nature and in that oversoul, in that higher connection where they transcended. Their central force was nature. Are we seeing a pattern here? What did they talk about? Well, they talked about their gut feelings. They talked about how they could combine their knowledge, what they knew intellectually, with their emotions and getting in touch with their inner senses and connecting all of those things to nature. And they could achieve sort of a connection with the highest power of the soul. Are you thinking now that they're sounding a little hippie-ish? Maybe before we were thinking Eastern philosophy, now we're thinking maybe hippie-ish, and you combine that with the utopian society, the commune, if you will. And basically, what we have with our transcendentalists are the first American hippies. They they came before any other anybody else. The 60s wasn't uh, a revolutionary time period, folks. It was certainly wasn't any new ideas going on. Uh, transcendentalists were hanging out with each other and getting in touch with the now and having God and humanity and nature be as one kind of hippie-ish personalities um, long before the 1960s.
And who did they believe they were? Well, you think all the way back to the Puritans. And the Puritans believed that they were um, the chosen people. And the Romanticists felt like, gosh, you know, we're citizens of this great new country. And the Transcendentalists said, we are the intellectuals with a plan for a perfect society. Now, some of the big leaders of transcendentalism, um, in fact, probably the biggest one is Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he was a lot of things. So we can learn a lot of things about Emerson, which we will learn about later. But right now, we're just going to learn that he was started out as a minister. He left the ministry to become a writer, a philosopher, a teacher, and a lecturer. And along his path, along the way, he ran into a young man by the name of Henry David Thoreau. And um, Henry David Thoreau was so enamored, he's much younger than Emerson, and was so enamored with Emerson's ideas um, that he basically sort of turned his life around. And he became also a philosopher and a writer. Uh, whereas Emerson was able to maintain a, a stable job and support his family, um, Thoreau didn't find a lot of value in that. In fact, he's the guy who built a cabin in the woods and, and hung out there for a while and did a lot of soul searching. And he spent really his entire life doing those kinds of things. We do have some other writers during this time period that were writing some other th things besides essays and short stories. We have the fireside poets, and they were writing the kind of poetry that was accessible to the common man. So now literature, if you remember in the nationalism period, anybody and everybody was writing. The fireside poets were writing poetry that did have some artistry to them, but they also were the language of the people. And the reason that they were called fireside poets is because of an evening um, after the chores were done and everyone was sitting around the fire. They couldn't turn on the television show and and watch uh, Community or New Girl or, or um, The Amazing Race or whatever it is that you watch. They read aloud to each other. Oftentimes they would read out of the Bible, but now they have some new American um, language and poetry to talk about. And so they would share the fireside poets by the fire. And the fireside poets topics were common everyday American life. Some of the names, for some reason, uh, many of them felt that it was necessary to have three names. So we have Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Robert Lowell, and John Greenleaf Whittier. And they wrote a lot of nature poems and perspectives and, and vignettes of American life. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to touch on two authors who kind of went in between uh, the movements into realism, and that is Emily Dickinson and who was a recluse and a poet, and Walt Whitman, who was a poet himself and an activist. But we will learn more about them in the next lecture. So stay tuned.